Okay, uh, I'm on? I'm on, great. Um, so I hope you will be all uh, able to hear me. Uh, there's still a little bit of commotion behind me. Uh, but yeah, hi, welcome. Nice to be here again. Uh, I don't know if you remember those of you who were here last year. Uh, I was talking about what's new in M. Uh, this time I decided to do what's new in Android. So we will talk about N. Um, but, you know, Android and what's happening in Android is not all about the platform. And so for those of you who haven't had time to go through all the things we discussed at I.O., all the things that are happening with, you know, the tools and everything uh, that we at Google are, um, are creating for you to enable you to create better apps, uh, let's go through some um, new things in developer tools first. So you probably know, you, I hope you're all using Android Studio by now. Is anyone still on Eclipse? Two hands. Okay, that's pretty good. Uh, come talk to me later. Uh, what's stopping you from going to Android Studio? I'm curious to hear that. Um, yeah, so you probably all know Android Studio 2.0. We have this new instant run. We have the faster emulator with, uh, you know, um, faster install times, the even uh, physical hardware. Uh, that's all not very new things now. Uh, but right now we're at Android Studio 2.2, which is still in preview. Uh, and it has lots and lots of improvements. So I'm just going to go through a laundry list of things. And this presentation is more or less uh, will be a laundry list of things that you hopefully haven't heard before and you will learn here. Um, also, we will not, I will not go really deep into those APIs because we have lots of blog posts and videos on every API in N uh, so that you can go home and after hearing about it here, you can actually go and um, uh, in, you know, in the um, piece of your own home, uh, read those docs and really understand how to implement it. Um, so let's get started. In Android Studio 2.2, we have a, a whole new packaging tool chain. Uh, so it's supposed to bring, bring you uh, the fastest build times possible for debug builds and the smallest possible uh, file size for release builds. And uh, to do that, that, um, the new packaging um, uh, packaging tool chain um, does a lot of things, like uh, sorts files so that they don't differ from release to release, and the Play Store can calculate smaller delta um, file sizes. It zeroes out uh, metadata in the zip files. Uh, it supports uh, the new uh, version 2 APK signing scheme, which uh, is supported from Android N, and will make your install times uh, up to an order of magnitude faster. Uh, so if you do use the new tool chains, you will be uh, by, you don't have to configure anything new. If you use the new tool chain in Android Studio 2.2, you will have smaller builds, smaller updates for your users and faster install times. Um, so, you know, it's in preview still, but once it's out, I encourage you to do it for your um, release uh, build. There's a new constraint layout uh, editor. So it's a totally new layout for Android. Uh, it's in a support library, so you can use it, uh, you know, all the way back in all your APIs. And uh, basically, one, it has a really nice visual editor when you can actually finally drag and drop things and, uh, you know, uh, set constraints how one view is related to another. It's a little bit like a, re a relative layout, but a lot more advanced. And one nice thing about it is, um, you know, if you had li linear layouts and relative layouts, you had to use nesting. And at some point, you had views inside views inside views and lots of layouts. That all takes time to, you know, calculate at runtime. And with the constraint layout, everything, the, the view hierarchy is mostly flat. Uh, everything is done in one pass. It's a lot faster. It's super fun to use. Um, so, uh, by the way, everything I talk about that's in preview, when you use it, when you have feedback, come back to me. Because obviously, there's some things that are still not working in constraint layout, but we're curious to hear how you use it and what problems you encounter. Uh, there's a new test recorder, finally in preview three uh, of Android Studio 2.2. Uh, so if you're writing espresso tests for your apps, or if you just want to start, there's now an easy way to add tests. You basically launch your app in debug mode. Um, there's, there's like a separate window for the test recorder, and it records all the clicks that you do in your app. And after you finish uh, you know, going through your app, writing the test, uh, if, if you may, uh, you then add an assertion, and that is, gets actually saved as, as an espresso test, as a totally human-readable code. So you can go and edit it. Uh, you can you know, add uh, idling resources. You can make it more complicated. But for generating base tests for your apps, it's, it's a great tool, both for beginners and um, you know, people already familiar with espresso. Uh, we have a great new APK analyzer. So at Google I.O., I gave a talk about um, how to make your APK size smaller, and it's one of the tools that will help you do just that. So um, I have a, a, this is an early version again. It's, it's the first version of APK analyzer that, that we're ready to share with you. And basically what you can do with it is uh, browse the contents of the APK, uh, browse the resources uh, that are um, 
packaged in the APK, browse the Android manifest, the final one that gets generated from all your libraries and stuff, uh, and finally browse the DEX um, uh, files. So all the classes that uh, get it, get it um, packaged into your APK after proguarding, after you know, after removing all that's not necessary. And it shows you a few uh, nice things. So it shows you the raw file size of an APK, but it also shows you an estimated download size because the Play Store actually compresses the APK when it uh, sends it to the device. And even more, it shows you a breakdown of those download sizes for every file or every package in your ar archive. So you can go and look which things take up the most space in your APK. So that's, that's really nice. Um, and it's an early version, so we plan to do a lot more with the APK Analyzer. And again, if you have any ideas, uh, please let me know. And finally, there's a new PSD viewer, so Photoshop files, and you can import uh, Photoshop files into vector drawables. Uh, of course, Photoshop files that contain vectors, not bitmaps. And uh, improvements to the NDK. If you're writing native code, you can now use, now use CMake, um, which is the uh, native toolchain for uh, CLion, which is the base of our C, C++ support. And you can also use plain old NDK build projects. So that's for Studio. Uh, but you know, making apps is nothing without a good distribution channel. So there's Play is always improving. Uh, there's lots of stuff coming in Play that you might not be aware of. There's, uh, we just announced at I.O. there's this new uh, thing called the pre-launch report. Um, you have to go and enable it in your console. But after you do that, after you upload an APK to the alpha or beta channel, um, after some time, after a few minutes, uh, you will get this pre-launch report that will let you know the most important things about your app, about the APK that you just uploaded, uh, to let you know if it's ready for prime time or not. So basically, it runs the Fire Firebase test lab. Uh, so it runs your, um, runs your APK on real devices, on a matrix of real devices, and uh, gives you a report about any problems, um, about any crashes. Uh, it gives you screenshots of how your app looks uh, across these different uh, you know, screen sizes, languages, and so on and so on. So you can look at a glance if there's something you need to fix in your APK right now before actually publishing it. So it's a nice tool to, you know, that uh, will let you know if you're trying to shoot yourself in the foot by uploading something that doesn't work. And there's, there's lots of lots of uh, small things that we added over the past few months. So if you're using ProGuard, if you're um, you know, annoyed that your stack traces are obfuscated and you had to use a manual tool to deobfuscate them um, from the Play Store, you can now actually upload your ProGuard mappings file to the Play Store and all your uh, error stack traces from your users will come deobfuscated by default. Um, we have universal app campaigns, so an easy way to actually promote your app. We have acquisition tracking, so there's this whole um, panel that lets you know where your users are coming from, uh, from and how they actually learn about your app and who downloads it. We finally can generate promo codes that you can give out um, you know, to reviewers and sites and so on. And um, we also do some nice machine learning on um, user reviews. Uh, so we bring the most important information to you so, do you, you, so that you don't lose um, you know, the most important things that people t um, talk about in reviews about your app. But there's this another thing, apart from the Play Developer Console, which you actually see, and this is Play App Serving. So this is what happens behind the scenes, and we never actually talked about it uh, up to a few months ago when the Play App Serving team started really fighting for those download sizes um, so that users don't have to download a lot of um, you know, data uh, when you update your apps or when you publish them for the first time. And uh, just a few months ago, uh, we added this um, download size to the Play Store. Uh, so we used to have different sizes in the Play Store before, but they were, they were very ambiguous. So what does it mean for a user if an APK is like 50 meg? But you know we had Delta, Delta updates on the Play Store for a long, for a long time. Uh, Play Store is um, also gzipping your APKs, so that raw APK size didn't really mean anything. And from from now on, users see um, exactly the amount of data they will uh, have to spend to download your app or update your app. Uh, which hopefully will drive you, uh, developers, to push th those sizes as low as possible uh, because user users now will be more aware of that. Uh, but any anyway, to help you, we also introduced a new algorithm uh, that compresses, um, uh, that calculates better delta sizes for your updates. So if you have an old APK and a new APK, the update size between those will be now smaller without you having to do anything. Um, and it helps, especially in one case, if you're using native libraries in your code, remember to put them uncompressed in the APK. This will make the APK a little bit bigger, but the update will be a lot smaller. Uh, we also released uh, on our GitHub 
uh, under Google Samples, um, an APK patch size estimator. So if you're tracking that, if, you, if you're interested in seeing how your updates, update sizes uh, are going from version to version, you can now estimate that from a command line tool uh, that will uh, perform the same algorithm on your APKs and tell you the estimated uh, update size. And finally, we introduced APK as expansion files, compression, and patching. So if you're developing games, because so it's games that use that feature mostly, you know that these files could be huge. They could be like a gigabyte in size of textures. And every time you updated those, the, uh, your users had to actually download the whole thing. Now we have the same patching and delta mechanism for those as for APKs. And we're actually saving one petabyte of data for, you, for users a day, thanks to that. So um, now maybe... Um, for game developers, that will make it a little bit easier to update your apps and not be afraid that you know, the, the users will have to download a lot of, lot of data. And finally, if you haven't used it, um, there's a new Play Developer Console um, Android app. Um, fully functional. Go ahead and give it a try. And finally, what's new on Android platform? So Android N. Uh, just yesterday, I think, we uh, released Developer Preview 4. Uh, you should probably have it on your devices by now. If not, you can sideload it, and we publish the um, uh, the files that you can sideload to your phones and update them manually. Uh, and with that, we also introduced the final SDK. So starting from now on, from this SDK, we cannot change anything. We cannot change any methods, any attributes, anything. This is set in stone, and thanks to that, we are also enabling... Um, upload of apps targeting um, API 24 to the Play Store. So you can, uh, as of now, you can change your compile SDK version and ta target SDK version to 24 and upload those apps to the Play Store and start testing them with real users or um, on al alpha beta channels or even in production so that users on developer preview uh, will be able to get your apps. Um, but remember, well, setting compile SDK version to 24 will probably not break anything always, as always, when setting target SDK version to 24, all the behavior changes in the, new, um, in the new Android version apply. So before you do that, you have to get your apps ready and you have to test them. And so I will discuss a few of those most important behavior changes uh, that you need to be aware of before you actually start giving your users um, those APKs targeted at 24. So first of all, Project Volta has some improvements. Project Volta is our, um, um, it's a, an initiative at Google that aims to uh, reduce battery usage by the system and apps. Uh, so you know, uh, last year I introduced, uh, even here at the stage, that we uh, are adding a dose mode into Marshmallow, uh, which basically, uh, after you put your device away, like on a coffee table or something, it sits there, uh, no one's touching it, instead of uh, discharging and, and the app's running all the time, it actually uh, prevents the app from running um, and like only gives them this, this tiny window when they, when they can access the network, when they can actually do something. And this year we're extending this dose mode um, to extend battery life even while the devices are in use. So if I, had, I have my phone in my pocket, uh, the previous dose mode would never kick in because I keep moving around, the sensor um, you know, uh, wouldn't detect that the phone is stationary, but now this dose mode light will work um, when the screen is off. So um, whenever the screen is off, even if the phone is moving, after some time we will, um, um, we will turn on this light dose mode where apps cannot access network and um, all jobs and um, things are deferred. Uh, so that will, ho will hopefully fix uh, the battery life issue uh, for devices that you keep on you all the, at all times and you keep, uh, keep on using, but it is something you have to test with your apps. And this doesn't mean the old dose mode is, coming, uh, is, uh, is going away. They both work uh, together. So first, uh, we have, when the screen turns off, we have this dose light. And then when you put your device away, uh, we uh, kick in the full dose. And nothing's really changing as far as uh, guidance of how to deal with this um, comes for us. So, so uh, for things that really, really need to be timely and you know, instant, uh, we suggest using GCM uh, high priority messages that will wake your apps even in dose mode. Uh, foreground services are exempt from those, um, same, same as uh, in the previous version of Android. Although there was a bug where that didn't always work, we fixed that bug, so hopefully from now on it'll work every time. And finally, there's a whitelist. This is uh, like the last resort. If your app 
has to absolutely work um, while those um, is on. You can apply for, uh, for a whitelist, but be aware that there's only a few exceptions that we will make. They're listed on the, in the documentation, and if you're outside of those use cases, your app will be removed from the Play Store if you uh, apply for this whitelist. Uh, so just remember that. And um, the other thing is we did some background optimizations, which will also extend your battery a little bit, but it's more about memory. Uh, so on M, we saw a lot, lots of apps waking up at, at, um, at different times when you know, they weren't really needed because they listened to all those broadcasts um, that the system produces, like, for example, connectivity change. And suddenly, if I walk out from DroidCon and my phone loses Wi-Fi and then connects to 3G, uh, all those connectivity events would fire, and every app that listens to those events, uh, for every app, we will have to create a process, create the broadcast receiver, handle that, and even if the app does nothing, that would completely thrash the memory, and all those processes spinning up and killing would just kill the performance of your um, phone. That's why in this version, we're getting rid of a few broadcasts, of, of a few system broadcasts broadcasts um, that work like this. So first, first of them is connectivity change. You are no longer uh, able to listen for that broadcast uh, from a receiver registered in your manifest. If your app is already running, if you have a running component uh, and you register for this broadcast dynamically uh, using uh, context register receiver, you can still get it. Uh, but your app will not be woken up from the background um, when it's not running. Um, from a uh, receiver registered in the manifest. So that's a big change. Um, the thing we suggest very, very strongly, use Job Scheduler. Job Scheduler lets, lets you run those background tasks that you need um, at, at the right moment uh, with, with other background tasks. Um, it will not deplete the user's battery. It will not thrash your phone's memory. Um, it's better for everyone. And of course, the question developers always ask is, how do I use Job Scheduler if it's only available from API 21? Uh, well, in Google Play Services, we have this thing called GCM uh, Network Manager, which is almost the same thing as Job Scheduler. It's basically a backport for all the devices. And even now at I.O., we released a new version of that, which is called the Firebase Job, Dispatch Job Dispatcher. And it has, a, it has a nicer API, I would say. And we'll probably go forward um, with... Uh, developing Firebase Job Dispatcher more. Um, for those of you who have never used Job Scheduler, it's really simple. Um, you get a system service. Um, you basically create a job info object that holds all the restrictions you put on, the, on, your, on your job. So uh, if, it, if it needs to run when the phone is charging, if it needs to uh, run only when the user is not paying for data, so if uh, the user is on Wi-Fi, for example, and you just schedule that job, and the system will, will uh, come, and, uh, come back and run your service when the best time comes for that. The other two broadcasts that we're removing are new picture and new video. So I don't know if many of you use those broadcasts, but basically when, when the user is taking photos, after each photo, the system would trigger this and send this broadcast, there's a new picture available, there's, there's a new photo. And every app that, for example, synchronizes your albums would go and take this photo and upload it, upload it to the cloud, which... Um, when the user is still taking photos was probably not the right thing to do because all those apps would start spinning up and using the CPU and using network and everything, and the camera would just die on the user, and that wasn't a really good experience. Uh, so uh, now we're getting rid of those as well, and because there was no real way to, do, uh, to act on those new photos in the framework, we are extending the job scheduler API so that you can actually trigger jobs on content providers. So whenever there's a new item in a content provider, um, you can schedule a job that will run um, whenever there's a, there's a new thing. And again, it will not happen immediately. It will happen at the right time, and you just don't have to worry about it. Unfortunately, uh, this API in Job Scheduler is only available from N and above, so from API 24 and above. And uh, I don't think there is a version in GCM Network Manager or Firebase Job Dispatcher, but hopefully uh, it will come very soon. And if you're interested in both of those topics, so Vault optimizations and memory optimizations, I really suggest you go and listen to and watch a talk from Google I.O. It's called Android Battery and Memory Optimizations. It's available on YouTube. And the two, um, uh, the, the, the people who did that talk um, 
talk a little bit more about our vision for the platform for the future. So if you want to learn about how we imagine the platform and background jobs and job scheduler will look in the future releases of Android potentially, um, then this is, this is very, a very interesting uh, talk. And if, uh, again, f about feedback, if you have any use cases that cannot be handled by the current state of APIs and some, your app needs to do something that is not covered and will just not work, please let me know about it because we are bringing feedback to the team for the next releases of Android. And there's been also a few uh, small improvements in how job schedule works in the end. So, uh, for example, before for uh, for any task that needed, needed to run instantly. Right now, when the app is running, you would use an intent service. Uh, you're fine to do that. It's, it's cool. Intent service can work for foreground, foreground apps. Don't worry. But if you want to use job schedule for that as well, we are now prioritizing jobs that uh, are coming for, from apps that are in the foreground. And also, um, we are uh, optimizing jobs in the background uh, as, it, as far as uh, available RAM on the phone, on the device, uh, goes and, you know, just not to thrash the phone again with all those processes spinning up. And there's a few other small breaking changes. Uh, these are the things you need to do before you target uh, SDK 24 and start releasing your apps. So passing file URIs between apps. This was my pet peeve on the platform for a long time. Whenever I would use one app and another app from another developer and try to share a photo between those two apps, about half of the time, things would just not work. If, I'm, if I have my file, my photo in the cloud, and the other app expects it to be on the, on the device, on the uh, internal memory, things would just break. And it was a bit of a chicken and egg problem. So who fixes their app first? The one sharing the photo or, or the one receiving the photo? And even big apps were really reluctant to fix this because they knew uh, people would file bug reports against them for apps that received the photo and didn't work. Fortunately, this is now deprecated. It's fixed on the platform level. So if you target SDK 24, you can no longer pass file URIs between uh, process boundaries. So if, 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 if you create a file URI and share it in an intent somewhere to another app, uh, you will get an exception. And the solution is just to use a file provider. It's, uh, it's in the support library. It's very easy to use. It creates content URIs for your files uh, that your app owns and your app uh, created. And then you share those content URIs. And the, the receiving app, and that can also be your app, um, should just implement Content Resolver uh, open input stream on this content. And now you don't have to worry about permissions. You don't have to worry about uh, reading from external storage. Um, things should, should just work. So please go ahead and fix your apps if you haven't moved to content URIs uh, yet. And another thing, and I remember I was here on the stage last year, and I was telling developers who use uh, private APIs in uh, our framework to not do that, because on M, a few apps broke when we switched SSL pro uh, uh, the SSL, SSL library from open SSL to boring SSL. And I said, do not do this, because things will break. And now they're breaking. You cannot use private APIs, uh, sorry, private, uh, yeah, private um, native APIs or uh, private libraries that are embedded in the framework from your apps. Uh, so during developer preview, we will show this toast whenever you launch an app and access private libraries uh, from the framework. Um, but um, for apps that target uh, 20, uh, 23 and lower. But for apps targeting 24, if you try to do that, your app will just break. So the solution is only use public APIs. And if you really need those libraries, you can compile them uh, yourselves and include them in your app. Just don't try to uh, dynamically open uh, things that are in the framework but are not supposed to be opened by you. So these were the breaking changes. These are the things that you need to do. But there are also, uh, you know, uh, the, the, this was pretty scary. Like, things will break, things will not work. But there are also some nice things in end. And these are the user-facing features. And so uh, one thing developers were waiting for for a long time was multi-window support. It's finally coming. It's, it works nicely, I would say. I like it. Uh, there's not a lot you have to do. So every app that targets 24 will be multi-window enabled by, by default. And uh, hopefully, you will not disable this support. Uh, you will just work with it and not against it. There's no real changes you have to do to your app. You just have to make sure that you support the smaller sizes, uh, uh, smaller layouts, and um, the trans transitions between those sizes. And one important thing, even though two apps can be shown on the screen at the same time, 
only one app will be in the resumed state. So this will be this will be the app that the uh, user interacts with, and this is a this is. No, nothing is changing in the activity life, life cycle, but because we didn't have this situation before where two apps were on the screen, uh, some video players, for example, would stop uh, video playback in on pause, whereas now we recommend you do it in on stop. So if I'm playing a video in one app and I'm interacting with the other, I probably want the video to keep playing. So just remember, only one app is resumed, but um, your app can be stopped but still visible. Um, there's a, a new thing called Data Saver. Um, so before we could restrict background data on a per app basis, now a user can do it on a per device uh, basis. So it's a device-wide setting. And it takes away um, access to network from all apps on the device unless an app is whitelisted. Um, this is nice for a user who's roaming, for example, or who's paying uh, for every megabyte they download. Uh, but it's a little bit more difficult for you as app developers, right? But we are giving you an API where you can actually check the status of the setting um, device-wide, and you can also check if your app was whitelisted. It's not very difficult. We just ask for one thing. Please respect this setting, and even if your app is whitelisted, do use the API and reduce your data usage. So, for example, if you're downloading huge images, if you see that the user has enabled data saver, and even though you were whitelisted, maybe you could download smaller images and save, save some data for the user. And also remember to always check if the network you're on is metered or not. So basically, a metered network uh, is one where the user potentially pays for every uh, byte they download, whereas an unmetered network will be like a public Wi-Fi that's free. Uh, we have a new way to access uh, external storage. Um, of course, there was, a, there was a permission that you could ask before, uh, but if your app really needed, needed access to photos or just to music, and you had to ask the user, uh, let me access all the contents of your SD card, oh, that wasn't a very good situation, and the user would be, you know, uh, w would be right to decline it in some instances. So now with scoped folder access, you can actually um, just ask for access to one uh, specific folder. So we created uh, folders like photos, music, movies, podcasts, ringtones. And if your app just needs to access photos, you can ask just that. And what's even nicer, after you get access to that folder, you can use the um, normal, usual file APIs to access the contents of this folder. Uh, so you don't have to deal with like, like the storage access framework and this, all this confusing uh, framework stuff. And it works pretty much as uh, just like runtime permissions, although it's not a runtime permission. It's just a thing that the framework gives you. And finally, direct boot. Uh, this, is, uh, this is a very underestimated feature of Android, I'd say. But it's, it's, uh, it's a nice, nice thing for um, developers who are working on messaging apps or alarm clocks. Basically, any app that needs to provide timely, important notifications to the user. And what it lets, lets you do is it lets your app run just after the device has finished booting, but before the user uh, has a chance to unlock the, their device for the first time with a pattern or pin or password. Um, it's a little bit difficult to implement. So now, starting from N, um, every app will have two storage areas for their private data. One is called the device storage, and one is called uh, the credential uh, protected storage. And to make your app run during direct boot mode, you have to make sure that, uh, that the data that you need just to, re to, to, to run the smallest part of your app that will uh, run before the lock screen is dismissed is stored in device protected storage, whereas the credential protected storage is available only after the user unlocks uh, from the boot screen. Um, I wrote a blog post explaining this uh, in detail. Uh, there will also be a dev byte. So if, if you're writing a messaging app uh, or if you're writing an alarm clock and you have to uh, make sure that these messages and these alarms will fire even if the user forgets to unlock their phone, please go ahead and read the blog post and implement direct boot. Uh, we also have a new uh, notification style. Uh, if you're using the platform APIs to create your notifications, so the, you know, the big inbox style um, and all the other styles that we give you, there's not much you have to do. Uh, if you're customizing your um, notifications, um, you will have to make sure that uh, with the new background, with the new style, everything will fit and look uh, well. Um, one thing to note is now we show the app's name here. 
Uh, so for all of the, the, for those of you who, uh, hopefully not, but if you are spamming your users with notifications, please don't do this, and the user will now have a really easy way of telling which app is actually doing that. Um, two more things coming in notifications. You might know them from Android Wear. Uh, now on bigger devices, on phones and tablets, uh, with starting with Android N, uh, we have the same APIs for direct reply and for uh, bundling notifications as on Android Wear. Uh, so if you already implemented those, it should work. Um, if not, please do. Uh, if you have lots of messages, uh, like for example in Gmail here, a user can then expand and have a notification per message. Um, or here on the video on the left, uh, I get a Hangouts message, I can reply in line without opening the app, and I can continue the conversation just from um, the reply uh, action item there on the uh, notification. There's a few other things uh, that you can implement. Quick settings styles. These are the, the uh, quick settings that you open from the top of the screen from the not notification shade. Uh, you can finally implement your own. It's a very easy API. You implement the service, override two methods, customize an icon, provide, uh, provide an action. That's it. You can have your own quick settings style. Uh, the only uh, thing is the user has to add your tile. So you can't, again, you can't spam the uh, notification shade with tiles for your app. The user has to go and actually um, add your tile uh, to the no notification shade. Um, you can now, uh, a user can now uh, adjust the display size uh, for, the, for the whole device. So you have to make sure that your apps work on different densities. So even if you are testing your apps on very, very small displays, because there are almost no phones like that, uh, please create an emulator with a very small uh, display size and check if all your layouts display correctly. Um, multiple locales. Uh, so we used to have just one locale per, per device. Now a user, like a multilingual one, can specify uh, many languages that they speak, and your app can actually use an API, a platform API, to check which languages your user likes and uses, and uh, you know customize the content that you show. So for a search app, for example, you could show search result results in those languages. And direct boot I talked about. There's lots of other developer um, features in, in N. So we have Java 8 languages features. You can use lambdas. Uh, you can use static interface methods. Unfortunately, only lambdas are um, backwards compatible. Um, all the other things from Java 8 are uh, N only. Uh, there's a new ICU4j um, uh, public API. So that used to be hidden in the framework. Um, uh, if you don't know what it, what it is, you probably never needed it. It's basically for um, uh, working with uh, languages and, and text. Um, there's a key, key store attestation. So you can, if, if you're working on security apps, on banking apps, now there's a stronger way to make sure that the keys that, uh, uh, that, that you're using in your app are actually stored in the hardware, in the, uh, in the hardware element on the device, and that no one tampered with them and also declarative security config. So people used to shoot themselves in the foot by creating uh, SSL code by hand or copying it from Stack Overflow, and usually the top-rated answer was almost always wrong, unfortunately, in this case, is you never re-implement security. That's, that's the rule. And uh, now we can do it declaratively. So there's a way of specifying the certificates, the keys that you use in XML, and so that you don't have to write your own co code, and there's no way for you to actually break it. Um, and there's a new, like I said, there's a new signature scheme. Uh, so if you're using the new Android Studio tools, you will get faster install times. Also, there's no ahead of time compilation that makes the install time even faster. There's nothing you really have to do with it. Just be aware and um, you benefit from it as developers. And it's, we still have some time for Q&A, I think. So, yes, we yep. have. Yes, we do. Thank you. And In I welcome. Place. Thank you for sharing all this with us. Yeah. Number one, number so two, number three. Just one thing. Okay. Let's take quick questions now, but if you have longer feedback for all the yeah. things that I mentioned, do find me. I'll be hanging around all day. We have five minutes for Q&A. Uh, Java 8 features means full Java 8 with functional programming or just what you mentioned? With, with, sorry? Full, uh, uh, full map and the reduce. So the full and streams and so on, or just the lambdas? Uh, so like I said, we have uh, lambdas that are uh, actually created during compilation and they're backward, backwards compatible. There's static inter interface methods, there's uh, multiple annotations on a method, but that is only an N. And also there, I think there's a few packages in the framework, uh, but I, uh, I would have to confirm which ones. So we have uh, probably some of the functional stuff, but not, not everything. Definitely not everything from Java 8.
that's why we say just just some features, right? Yeah, my question is: um, Will declarative security configuration will it be um, backported like a security configuration, or will it just be N on? I, I'm pretty sure it's N only. Okay. Where was number three? Okay. You're so quick, we can even take number four, maybe five. Uh, the detection of a metered connection, is this done by marking it by, uh, from the UI or does Android uh, so do this? Th there, there's two ways. So the, I think by default uh, the 3G, 4G connection is uh, metered. Uh, a Wi-Fi connection is unmetered. But if a user is using hotspots like an Android hotspot or so on, there's actually a UI for the user to mark which, which of them are uh, metered. And I think there's even some uh, automatic detection. Um, so for some hotspots uh, created on phones, uh, I think this information is, is detected. Any more questions? Do I see any more? Oh, oh, yeah. Here. I'm going to get paid by the mile. <laughs> Hi. Um, what about instant apps? When is it going to be available? Uh, well, I can't say more than was announced at I.O. Uh, I don't think we announced the date. There's, there's this, uh, on developers Android com, there's a page where you can sign up if you want to take part in it. Uh, but, yeah, it's not something I can talk about right now. But I'm super excited for it to be coming. It's, it's going to be awesome. Was it that? Yeah, that was it. Thanks again, okay. Wojtek. Thanks all, and thanks for find sharing. me later.